Millions of these tires were dropped into the ocean to try and save our coral reefs. Unfortunately, even good ideas can go wrong, and this one did. Our oceans are in crisis, struggling with an astonishing 18 billion pounds of plastic every year. But let's journey back to the 1970s, off the coast of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Here, something remarkable unfolded. Two million used car tires were not discarded as waste, but instead sunk into the sea. Their purpose? To rescue dying coral reefs. It sounds like a plot from a science fiction movie, doesn't it? This unconventional yet earnest attempt to aid marine life has baffled scientists and environmentalists alike. Join us as we dive deep into the ocean's hidden depths to witness the impact of these rubber materials in safeguarding our marine environments. The Tyre Mountain, beneath the waves. Every single year, a staggering 18 billion pounds of plastic end up floating in our seas. Picture this. If we collected and distributed all that waste evenly, we could fill five garbage bags for every meter of coastline across the planet. The issue of ocean pollution is like a ticking bomb, ready to explode at any moment. Let's take a step back to the 1970s for a moment. In a place near Fort Lauderdale, in Florida, there was an attempt, not very well known, aimed at protecting the local coral reefs. To help, individuals placed a colossal number of old tires, precisely two million, directly onto the reef. You may be shaking your head thinking, what a bizarre idea, and indeed it was. However, the folks behind this had believed they were contributing positively to marine life. It's a strange tale for sure, and the details are quite unexpected. Stay with me, and I'll explain exactly why there's a mountain of tires lying under the ocean waves. Before we get into the peculiar story of these tires, we need to discuss some seriously concerning background information. Let's go back even further to before 1972, when there were no regulations to prevent companies from dumping their waste into the ocean. Essentially, they could discard anything they wanted, no questions asked. Specifically, in the year 1968, estimates suggest that around 38 million tons of excavated earth 4.5 million tons of industrial waste, another 4.5 million tons of sewage sludge, a shocking 100 million tons of various plastics, and not to forget, between two and four tons of hazardous chemicals were carelessly tossed into the ocean. In addition to all that, about 1 million tons of harmful metals also made their way into the seawaters. This lack of regulation and oversight led to the ocean becoming a dumping ground for all sorts of harmful materials. But let's not forget, these figures are just rough estimates. The real situation could be even worse, because back then, no one kept a record of exactly how much damaging material was dumped into the sea. If you're finding this shocking, hold on, there's even more to this story. According to documents from the United States, from 1946 to 1970, the Pacific Ocean became the resting place for over 55,000 barrels containing radioactive waste. But wait, there's more. Around 34,000 tons of this dangerous radioactive material were also discarded into the sea at three different locations off the East Coast between the years 1951 and 1962. Yuck. In simple terms, we have historically treated our oceans very badly. Now these facts are definitely upsetting, but it's crucial to understand that we're reflecting on these actions from a time when we have become much more aware of the importance of protecting our environment. In those days, people didn't understand the impact of their actions like we do today. There was a lack of awareness and concern for the long-term health of our planet and its oceans. The sad truth is that back then, the ocean was treated like a giant trash can a place where you could just throw anything you didn't want anymore, including dangerous and toxic materials. We now understand much better how dangerous materials affect our world than folks did in the 1950s. Thanks to the hippie wave in the 1960s, there was a big shift in how people in America thought and felt about nature. They started caring more about the Earth. By the time 1972 rolled around, the government decided it was time to put a stop to dumping garbage into the sea, a big win. Now, businesses that used to get rid of huge amounts of trash had to figure out different ways to clean up their act. 
And this leads us to the story about the car tires. Back in the 1970s, with the car industry doing really well, there were about 170 million new car tires made every year in America. That's a huge pile of rubber. Even though people had started recycling a little bit in the 1960s, most old tires ended up in big piles of trash or were burned up. But then, in 1972, a group called Broward Artificial Reef Inc. came up with a bold idea that could solve two problems at once. Get rid of the unsightly heaps of old tires and help fix some of the harm we've done to the sea. Their big idea? Use those old tires to make an artificial reef near the coast of Fort Lauderdale. You see, natural coral reefs are like big underwater cities full of life. They're home to lots of sea creatures and are super important for the health of our oceans. But these reefs are disappearing, which is really bad news for ocean life. The idea was that by putting old tires in the sea, they could give coral a new place to grow. More coral means more fish and other sea life moving in. Voila, you've got a brand new bustling underwater neighborhood. It sounded like a wild idea, but it wasn't completely out there. Other places like the northeastern United States, the Gulf of Mexico, and even countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia, and Africa had made similar artificial reefs. So, why not try it in Florida? It seemed like a perfect solution, right? Well, hold on to your hats. The project got the green light from the government in 1974, and that spring, over 100 boat owners pitched in to help. Each boat loaded up with thousands of old tires, all tied together, and set off to drop them into the sea over a big area, 7,000 feet from the shore. The idea caught on so well that even the big tire company Goodyear joined in. They didn't just lend a hand, they went all out, dropping a giant, shiny gold tire from one of their blimps right over the new reef spot. Talk about making an entrance. All in all, an astonishing two million tires ended up in the ocean, creating what was hoped to be a new underwater paradise called the Osborne Artificial Reef. Just picture it, a massive wave of tires spilling out into the ocean from boats. Quite the sight, don't you think? Now that's what I call an ambitious plan. Get ready to find out what happened after people tried to help the ocean in a big way. What really happened to that dream project under the sea? From hopes to hazards, the reef's reality. Now let's fast forward to 50 years later. The scene has changed completely, almost beyond recognition. Are you excited to see how it turned out? The colorful corals, the schools of fish? Turns out they're not there. Despite all the good intentions and the high hopes, the Osborne Artificial Reef turned out to be a huge flop. Let's backtrack a bit. Remember when I told you that the tires were held together with steel clips and nylon? Well, it turns out nobody thought about making sure the steel wouldn't just fall apart over time. You see, steel tends to rust when it's exposed to water. This rusting happens because the steel, which has iron in it, loses electrons when it gets wet. This loss turns the iron into a kind of crumbly, reddish-brown stuff known as rust. And guess what? Rust forms five times faster in salty seawater than in fresh water, thanks to the salty bits helping electricity flow better. So, if you put untreated steel into the sea, you're asking for trouble. It doesn't take long for the rust to make the steel fall apart, and that's putting it mildly. Not long after the tires were dumped, the metal clips holding them together gave out. This meant that all two million tires were now free to roam the ocean floor. And here's where it gets even worse. Florida often gets hit by really strong storms. These storms stir up the ocean and create powerful currents. These currents then picked up the now free tires and threw them against the existing natural reefs. Instead of helping to build up a new reef, the tires were smashing into the old one, completely wrecking it. But the destruction didn't stop with just the area around the reef. Big storms, like Hurricane Opal in 1995, spread the chaos even further. Opal flung over a thousand tires all the way to the Florida Panhandle. Then, three years later, Hurricane Bonnie carried thousands more tires to the beaches of North Carolina. Instead of a dream of underwater renewal, 
the tire project turned into a nightmare, scattering harmful debris far and wide. The situation was a complete disaster. But wait, there's more. You've probably heard the old phrase, a rolling stone gathers no moss, right? Well, it turns out that tires that keep moving don't allow corals to attach and grow. The tires not only wrecked the existing reef, but they were also totally useless in creating any new marine life. You see, coral reefs need clean, stable, and warm environments with plenty of fish and other sea creatures around to thrive. Now, imagine a tire flung all the way to North Carolina, some 900 miles away. That's hardly the place for a new coral colony to start, right? However, let's not throw all our hope overboard yet. There's a bit of a silver lining concerning the Osborne Reef situation. Back in 2001, some smart folks from Nova Southeastern University got a $30,000 grant to start cleaning up the mess. With this money, they were able to send divers down to the bottom of the ocean to gather up 1,600 of those rogue tires. Yes, in the grand scheme of things, that's a drop in the ocean, pun intended. But hey, it's a start. For three decades before this effort, pretty much everyone turned a blind eye to the underwater tire graveyard. So, when they finally did get moving, pulling up each tire cost about $17, a serious chunk of change. If you did the math for the whole mess, cleaning up the entire reef could run anywhere from a staggering $40 million to an eye-watering $100 million. No wonder things hit a bit of a standstill after that initial effort. But then, in a twist of fate, in 2007, the cleanup efforts got a second wind. The military, looking for a real-life scenario for training, picked the area around the tire reef. That year, during their exercises, they managed to haul about 10,000 tires out of the ocean. And it didn't stop there. The state of Florida chipped in with $2 million to help with the costs of transporting and disposing of the tires once they were on land. By 2009, this renewed push had led to a total of 72,000 tires being removed from the ocean. A pretty solid effort. But, as with all things, the momentum slowed. The military moved on, and the vast majority of the tires remained under the sea. It looked a bit grim again, but I did say there was a silver lining, didn't I? Between the years 2016 and 2019, things really began to turn around. Thanks to a whopping $4.3 million contract awarded to the Industrial Divers Corporation, some serious cleaning got underway. This wasn't just picking up a few tires here and there. This was a major operation aimed at finally tackling the problem head on. Now, after seeing what went wrong before, let's see how new ideas and new people are trying to clean up the ocean. The shocking price of purifying waters. At the height of their efforts, the Industrial Divers Corporation was pulling out between 2,000 and 5,000 tires each week. Imagine that. By the end of their runs, they had managed to gather a staggering total of 250,000 tires. Yet, despite this massive effort, about two-thirds of the tires still lay scattered on the ocean floor. This ongoing mission was turning into a costly affair for the government of Florida, draining more and more resources. But then, something changed. A new solution appeared on the horizon, one that promised to be much more cost-effective. In 2021, a private entity called 4Ocean stepped into the scene. They set their sights on a 34-acre patch of ocean just north of where all those tires had originally been dumped. They came up with a unique approach. They decided to fund their cleanup operations partly by selling bracelets. Yes, you heard that right. Bracelets. These weren't just any bracelets, though. They were made from the very tires that were being pulled out of the ocean, and they were selling for $29 each. 4Ocean had a catchy pitch on their website. For every bracelet sold, they would remove five pounds of waste from the ocean. Pretty cool, right? By 2022, they had made some impressive strides. Their estimates showed that only about 500,000 tires or roughly 25% of the original number, remained underwater. That's a significant dent in the problem. But here's where things get a bit more complicated. Let's go back a bit 
Remember when I mentioned that the initial efforts by Nova Southeastern University were costing around $17 for each tire they removed? Well, I did a bit of number crunching, and though these aren't exact figures, they give us something to think about. On average, a car tire weighs about 25 pounds. Based on 4 Ocean's claim, each $29 bracelet pays for the removal of 5 pounds of waste. If we break down those numbers, the cost to remove a single 25-pound tire, which is the average weight, works out to about $145 if funded entirely by bracelet sales. That's a lot of money compared to the original cleanup costs, isn't it? But let's dive deeper into this. The situation opens up a whole bunch of questions about the cost of environmental cleanup, the role of private companies in these efforts, and how sustainable these business models are. This is about a really surprising situation. The cost to clean up the mess we are talking about right now is more than eight times higher than what it was the first time around, which was 20 years ago. But let's not jump to conclusions right away. I need to explain a few important points. To start, the original cleanup happened a long time ago, two decades to be exact. During this time, the cost of almost everything we buy has increased significantly. On top of that, the group responsible for the cleanup this time, known as 4Ocean, operates as a business looking to make profits, unlike a non-profit organization. They also have to deal with various business-related expenses that academic staff, like those found in universities, don't usually have to consider. However, even considering these factors, the fact that the cleanup costs over eight times more does raise some eyebrows. Indeed, they are doing more cleaning than anyone before, but it also appears they are gaining a large financial benefit from this. This situation leads us to ponder whether we should be critical of businesses that aid environmental causes, but also make a significant profit. Or perhaps, am I deflecting from the more pressing issue here? The main concern should be asking why the individuals or groups that cause the pollution weren't made to handle the cleanup themselves. Now, let's shift focus to Goodyear, the tire manufacturing company. They seemed quite content to provide equipment for free to dispose of old tires into the sea. They even went as far as to add a huge gold-colored tire to the mix for some reason. It looks like they've conveniently erased this from their memory now. They were more than pleased to relocate tires bearing the Goodyear brand from garbage dumps to the depths of the ocean. Garbage dumps are not only eyesores but also tarnish the reputation of a business. However, the site of this disposal, known as Osborne Reef, is not visible like the usual garbage on land. It's submerged underwater. Since it's hidden below the waves, it's easily forgotten by most. Here's something that's really bothering me, and I need to share it with you. Imagine if the very companies that are creating environmental problems start realizing they can make a lot of money by cleaning up these problems. What if they begin to pollute the environment intentionally, knowing they can earn cash to clear it up afterward? That idea frightens me a lot. Now, I'm not accusing the company 4Ocean of doing this. I believe they are trying to do good things for our planet. However, this is a possibility that we can't ignore and it's a disturbing thought. And there's more to this story. It's not just the Osborne Reef that has faced the consequences of tire pollution. A similar incident occurred in France during the 1980s. This happened close to the beautiful French Riviera, where about 25,000 tires were thrown into the ocean. The people involved thought it wouldn't lead to any negative outcomes. However, they were wrong. Fast forward to 2005, and researchers have made a worrying discovery. They found that the submerged tires were emitting harmful chemicals and metals into the surrounding seawater. Normally, in tiny amounts, these elements might not be a problem. But when there's too much of them, they become toxic to marine life. This pollution can interfere with the normal growth of sea animals and plants, and in worse cases, it can lead to their death. As we move from one story to another, we go from America to France to see how everyone faces the same big water problems. The reality of fake coral reefs. Thanks to fast and clear decisions, the French government and the tire company Michelin 
managed to take away most of the old tires in a big cleaning job. This whole process ended up costing a bit more than $1.1 million, which works out to about $44 for each tire. This price was way lower compared to what the organization 4Ocean had to spend. Today, scientists from the Ocean Conservancy, a group that wants to protect the ocean, tell us that fake reefs might not really help much, even the ones that seem to work at first. There are so many problems that can happen because of these artificial reefs. They can have poisonous paint, plastic parts, and can harm the living spaces of sea animals. But the worst part? They don't actually create new fish. Remember, that was the main reason for having them. Instead of making new fish homes, these fake reefs just make fish from other places, often from natural reefs, come and stay in one spot. Then, fishermen notice this and catch too many of them. This starts a very bad cycle. But even though experts don't agree with making more artificial reefs, they are still being made, with different levels of success. Near Key Biscayne, Florida, there's this man-made reef called Neptune Memorial Reef, which opened in 2007. It was made to hold something pretty unique. Can you guess? It's not tires, but it's actually meant for the ashes of people who have passed away. Yes, really. They mix these ashes with a special kind of cement that's okay for the sea. This cement doesn't change the water like normal cement does. They turn this mix into big concrete shapes. These shapes can be really heavy, from 550 to a huge 4,000 pounds. They're so heavy that they definitely won't be moved by the sea. They are made strong enough to last through the worst storm seen in the last 100 years. But there's more to these shapes than just being strong. Their outside is very bumpy, which is perfect for coral to grow on, which is really smart. When they finish making these memorial pieces, they put them down in a big area under the sea, 600,000 square feet big, where each one is placed very carefully. This underwater area is arranged like a big city under the sea with paths, a big centerpiece, and even seats and sculptures under the water. How cool is that? The Neptune Memorial Reef was the idea of a sea scientist named Gary Levine and an artist named Kim Brandel. They dreamed of making a place where the ashes of over 125,000 people could be kept. As of the year 2022, this special underwater place only had about 1,500 people's remains, including the famous cook Julia Childs. But even though not many people have used this service yet, the underwater area is getting more popular with sea life. Now, there are over 140 different types of sea animals living there, which is pretty impressive. The people who look after this place have made sure it's in a safe zone for the sea life. This means people can visit by boat, dive underwater to see it, and remember their family members or friends. But they don't allow fishing or catching lobsters there because that would harm the sea creatures and plants living around the memorials. If you're thinking about this as a final resting place for someone you care about or even for yourself, you might want to know about the cost. The simplest option starts at $13,000, which is a lot of money. And if you want something more fancy, it could go all the way up to 85. That's a huge amount, plus this price doesn't even include the cost for the cremation process, which is between three five hundred and seven eight hundred on its own. So it's clear that this isn't a sharp option, but there seems to be nothing bad about it at first glance. They will learn it from past mistakes made by other projects like the Osborne Reef and have improved their methods. However, let me share some concerns. Cremating a body isn't the best for the environment. It releases a lot of CO2, about 900 pounds per person. This CO2 adds to climate change, which is not good for our planet. But it's not really fair to blame this reef for all the issues with cremation since people would still choose cremation whether this reef exists or not. But there's a catch about the concrete used for the memorials. Making concrete is not great for the earth because it's responsible for a lot of CO2 emissions, which make up about 8% of the world's total. This CO2 can make the ocean more acidic, and that's bad for coral growth since corals need less acidic, more alkaline water. Even though this special reef uses a type of concrete that's safer for ocean life, 
making that concrete still hurts the environment. Lastly, let's talk about whether this whole idea is just for show. Some people might think creating a memorial reef is more of a fancy idea than a practical one. It's a unique way to remember someone, but it's also important to think about whether it's really worth the cost and environmental impact. So, before deciding on this as a final resting place, it might be good to consider all these factors. New ideas meet old ones, and we think about what comes next. What lies beneath the Oriskany's secrets? The concept of living coffins, which refers to eco-friendly burial methods, is not a brand new idea. In the past few years, people have come up with different ways to make burials better for the planet. These methods include making coffins out of mushroom materials and creating urns that can grow into trees. However, I think it's correct to mention that these methods are just making small changes and are not really solving the bigger environmental problems. It's kind of like saying, I'll be gone, but turn me into a garden. Moreover, these eco-friendly burial options are much more expensive than the usual ways of burying people, which makes me think that only very rich people can afford to be environmentally friendly when they die. They pay a lot more money to become part of the earth again. So, while the Neptune Reef is fulfilling its purpose by being an underwater haven for marine life, I'm not totally convinced about its real benefit to the environment. This feeling of uncertainty also applies to another unusual underwater structure, the USS Oriskany. It's true that sometimes ships end up at the bottom of the ocean. However, the Oriskany story is different. It wasn't sunk during a fight or by an unexpected disaster. Instead, it was deliberately sunk. After being built in the 1950s and serving in both the Korean and Vietnam Wars, the ship was retired in 1976 and stored away for many years. It was moved around a few times until, in 2004, the Navy decided to sell it. And who bought it? Florida, of course. They decided to turn it into an underwater habitat for sea creatures. But instead of breaking the ship down and reusing its parts, which would seem like a sensible plan, in 2006, Florida did something extreme. They took the ship 24 miles south of Pensacola and blew it up using 500 pounds of explosives, creating a massive artificial reef. This action raises questions about whether this was really the most environmentally friendly or practical decision. To be honest, this story sounds like it's straight out of a movie, but it's actually true. The USS Oriskany, a huge ship that's now underwater, has surprisingly turned into a big hit. This ship, which is as long as three football fields put together, quickly became home to many sea creatures and a popular spot for people who love scuba diving. But here's where I have to be the one to bring down the mood. Now let's talk about what happened before the Oriskany was sunk. It underwent a big cleanup process to remove harmful substances, which is a complex way to say that people took out the dangerous materials to make it safer for the environment. But, Despite these cleanup efforts, there were still lots of toxic chemicals, known as polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, left inside the ship. These chemicals, which were commonly used when the Oriskany was built, were later found to be very bad for health and were banned in 1978. Now these harmful substances are part of the ship that's under the sea. We don't fully know if they're causing harm right now, but the idea that they might is worrying. It seems like a big mistake to overlook this. On one hand, the underwater reef created by the Oriskany seems to be thriving, but on the other hand, we might not see the negative effects of these chemicals for a while. But if the ship had been dismantled instead of being sunk, we wouldn't even have to worry about these problems. It's a complicated issue. On one side, the artificial reef has become a boon for marine life and diving enthusiasts, offering a unique underwater ecosystem. On the other side, the lingering question about the leftover harmful substances and their potential impact on marine life and water quality casts a long shadow on the project. If the ship had been dismantled and properly disposed of, these concerns wouldn't exist. Plus, Scrapping the ship could have meant recycling its materials and potentially avoiding the environmental risks that come with sinking a ship full of chemicals. 
The USS Oriskany holds a special place in many people's hearts due to its past military roles. If the ship had been dismantled, we would have lost an important part of history forever. Instead, by sinking it, we've given it a new life under the sea. This means that only people who are really good at scuba diving can visit it, but that's still better than nothing at all. It looks like the decision to sink the Oriskany was based more on feeling nostalgic than on thinking carefully about the environment. I want to point out that this approach, like with other artificial reefs, seems to be trying to fix a small problem, but might actually be adding to a much larger issue. Consider this. If you have a bunch of old tires, the solution shouldn't be to just throw them into the ocean. The same goes for leftover concrete. And it definitely should apply to a massive naval aircraft carrier like the Oriskany. This kind of thinking shows a pattern where, if there's too much of something and it's expensive to dispose of properly, some people might take the easy way out and dump it into the sea, hoping it will just become someone else's problem. With the Oriskany, as well as other projects like Osborne and Neptune reefs, we see a repeating story. There's usually a surplus of something nobody wants to pay to get rid of. So, these entities look for ways around the rules to just ditch it in the ocean and forget about it. If the artificial reef ends up being successful, then everyone involved starts congratulating themselves and enjoying the money they've saved. But if the project ends up being a disaster, like what happened with Osborne, they pretend like they had nothing to do with it from the start. So, what's the real story behind these submerged tire cities? An innovative solution turned environmental disaster or a misunderstood chapter in marine conservation. The oceans keep their secrets, but the truth often surfaces like a buoy in rough waters. Share your thoughts, unravel this aquatic enigma with us, and remember to like and subscribe for more deep dives into the world's most bewildering environmental mysteries.